Paul has just told Timothy that Jesus Christ entrusted him with the gospel. And now he goes further to explain to Timothy how Jesus had called one who was a wretched sinner and had equipped him by mercy and by grace to be able to be saved, to be able to fulfill this ministry as an apostle, and also set him as an example for those who would come after him who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this so overwhelms the apostle that he concludes this section with a great statement of praise to God the King. Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. James Jones, the pastor of the DeRitter Presbyterian Church in DeRitter, Louisiana. I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, as we look today at your amazing grace and mercy given to the Apostle Paul, how you saved him, how you equipped him, and how you set him as an example for us also to follow. We pray that you would bless us with our understanding of your word. May the Holy Spirit give us wisdom and insight into the scriptures this day. Please forgive our sins. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of God. I'm reading today from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is God's holy and inspired word. May he add his wonderful blessing to our understanding of it this day. The apostolic ministry to which Jesus called Paul as an apostle could not be done in human strength alone, nor can any ministry of the word today ever be done by mere human strength. Instead, we see that Paul was enabled or strengthened by the Lord in order to be able to accomplish this ministry that he was called to. The false teachers in Ephesus had loudly proclaimed that they were teachers of the law. That's what they wanted to be. And yet, their case is very similar to those today who would seek to be ministers of the gospel without being actually called by God to such work. In other words, all who try to perform the ministry apart from the supernatural aid of the Holy Spirit, of God sustaining and supporting and encouraging and enabling them as he did the Apostle Paul, all of those folks will ultimately fail even though they may for a period of time fool men on earth. Now, they will be found eventually to be what they are, which is deceivers and hypocrites and charlatans. Unlike those men, the Apostle Paul was called to be an apostle by the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and Christ equipped him to be able to perform this ministry. The power that Christ has, which is all power, remember he told his disciples after his resurrection and just prior to his ascension into heaven, that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. And that word authority means the, uh, the right to do things and the power to be able to do things. And so Christ has all power to do what he desires to do. 
And here he has called Paul, and therefore he uses this power that he uh, used to bring Paul from spiritual death to spiritual life to equip him to be able to perform the ministry. Now, when Paul writes, because he, Jesus, counted me worthy or faithful, putting me into the ministry, he is not saying that God looked down through the corridors of time and foresaw that Paul would make a good apostle and said, I'll choose him because of that. No, that's not ever what happens. Instead, we see Paul is, prior to his conversion, totally unfit for such a ministry. And so what he is saying, however, is that Jesus called him and also equipped him to be able to carry out this ministry. He equipped him by counting him as faithful uh, so that he would be able, therefore, to perform the duties of the apostleship to which Christ called him. The point is, all the power and all the glory that attaches itself in any way whatsoever to Paul's ministry all goes back to Jesus Christ because Christ is the one who has that power and conveyed that power to Paul in order to make him capable of fulfilling this ministry. All the more remarkable is the fact that Paul was so unworthy uh, of any type of grace or mercy that God would give him. And he explains that to us. We, we see in the next section here just how Paul himself was not worthy of the calling that Christ had given to him. Paul underlines the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in counting him worthy when he describes his life prior to conversion. Although I formerly was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And so Paul describes himself as a blasphemer. That is someone who says terrible things about someone else, and particularly about God, uh, who is defaming uh, God and God's honor and God's reputation. He blasphemed the Lord, he blasphemed uh, the church, and he sought also to make Christians blaspheme God. He was a persecutor. We know this, of course, from the book of Acts, where he is seen persecuting the church over and over again. This is a term, persecutor, that's only found in this place in the, the New Testament. And it is a term that describes a hunter chasing a wild animal, or to turn the image around, this is the image of Paul like a wild animal chasing after believers to kill them. Finally, he was an insolent man, he says. An insolent man is someone who outraged others, who insulted others, and he did this in his quest to destroy Christians. And so each one of these terms is a step farther along the road of sin. Uh, he was a blasphemer, and not only a blasphemer, he was a persecutor, and not only a persecutor, he was an insolent man. Now, we know that all of these things are true because Paul himself describes himself in this very way in Acts chapter 26. He is uh, giving the account of his conversion, and as he's telling about his conversion on the Damascus Road, building up to that, he says this, in Acts 26, verse 11. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And so all of these things, the uh, fact that he was a blasphemer, the fact that he was a persecutor, the fact that he was an insolent man are all described by Paul of himself in Acts chapter 26. Now, although this was Paul's manner of life prior to his confrontation by Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he tells us that he obtained mercy from the Lord. Obtain mercy. Now, in the next sentence, he's going to speak about grace. And we've already seen Paul using these two terms, 
mercy and grace over and over again. They often go together in Scripture. We saw already that grace is associated with our estate of sin. That grace is given to those who do not deserve God's favor, but actually deserve the opposite of God's favor, God's wrath and curse. And mercy has to do with our estate of misery. This has to do with the consequences of sin experienced by sinners. And so uh, we are in a miserable condition because of our sinful rebellion against God. Now, Paul says that he received mercy from the Lord because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, the question is, is Paul pleading extenuating circumstances here? Is he saying, I really wasn't guilty of anything because I didn't know better? No, that's not the excuse at all that he's using. He's not claiming to not be so bad because he didn't know what he was doing. Instead, he is showing us that his sin was great against the Lord. What he is doing, however, is differentiating between sin that is committed even with good intentions but is seriously wrong in the eyes of God versus sin that is committed with high-handed rebellion against God. In other words, it's sin done in ignorance of the truth versus sin done with a willful knowledge of the truth, but rebelling against that knowledge of the truth. Sin done willfully against the truth. Now, some might say, as John Calvin says in his sermon on this passage, Paul does not mean that sins which are knowingly and willingly committed cannot be forgiven. Otherwise, what would become of us? If everyone who had knowingly sinned against God were condemned without exception and with no hope of salvation, where would we be? And so Calvin goes on and he resolves this issue by saying this. In this passage, he associates unbelief and ignorance to demonstrate that he is speaking of willful resistance uh, to God's truth. And so... Uh, when Paul was confronted by the risen Lord Jesus Christ there on the Damascus road. And Paul asked, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul did not begin to curse him and shake his fist at him and say, I'll never have anything to do with you. But instead, he repented uh, immediately. He submitted to the Lord's will. He had thought up to that very moment that he had been doing God's will in persecuting Christians. And now he sees the truth that he has been wrong all along. And he submits to that. He learns that he has been ignorant of the truth of the gospel. And when he learns this truth by the grace of God, he submits to the Lord Jesus Christ in humility and repentance and faith. Paul continues, And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ overflowed abundantly to him that day and throughout the rest of his life. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was not just abundant. It was exceedingly abundant. Now what Paul does here is what he likes to do from time to time. And that is, choose a word that has a prefix attached to it that intensifies what's being said. And so, uh, he doesn't just say that uh, God's grace in Christ was abundant, but he uses the superlative. You can't go any farther than this. It was hyperabundant. He adds that uh, prefix, hyper, to it. And so what he means by this is God's grace goes far beyond all limits. This is similar to the same type of thing that he says in Romans chapter 5, where he makes this comment. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, 
Grace abounded much more. It hyperabounded. Once again, same thing. So this hyperabounding grace was accompanied by faith and by love in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that faith is absolutely necessary for salvation, but the problem that we all face is that we don't have faith. We are born in rebellion against God. We are born faithless. And so though God holds out salvation to us that we can receive, if we grasp it by faith, our hands are clenched. Philip Ryken, in his commentary, gives an illustration here of God coming to us, holding out that salvation, and then taking our hand and unfolding it and placing faith within it and closing our fingers back over that salvation by faith so that we can hang on to it. And that's what God has done for us. That's what God did for Paul. Uh, notice that grace and faith and love are in Jesus. They're only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other salvation that's available to mankind other than through Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so it is the name of Christ and Christ alone where we find grace and where we find love and where we find all of these blessings that are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And even the grace and the faith and the love that we need are given to us by our merciful Savior. Paul now introduces us and Timothy to one of his famous faithful sayings. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, the overflowing grace that was given to Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ was given to Paul as the worst of sinners. Paul mentions this faithful saying, and these faithful sayings are only found in Timothy and Titus, uh, to, and, and perhaps what these faithful sayings were was uh, an early hymn of some kind or perhaps an early confession of faith of some kind. But what Paul does is he takes these faithful sayings and he makes them his own. He personalizes them. Now, they're faithful sayings in the sense that all Christians throughout all time and all history can understand them. We know what he is saying when he says these things. And so they are faithful in that regard. Uh, they're worthy of all acceptance because Christians can understand and can agree with uh, what is said here in these faithful sayings. Now, he begins this statement uh, with a truth, which is Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. This is what Jesus says about himself in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. But Paul adds to this his own sinful condition at the end of this saying. So Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And as it relates to me, Paul says, of whom I am chief. That word chief is sometimes translated first or foremost. And what Paul is getting at here is if there were a lineup in this world, in history, of all of the sinners who have ever lived... I'm standing at the front of the line. I'm the worst of them. Now you could ask the question, how can Paul say this here when earlier he had written to the Philippian Christians and had said to them there in Philippians that according to the law, he counted himself as blameless. What does this mean? Is he stating a contradiction? No. As we look at what Paul has to say in Philippians regarding that, he was talking about the supposed righteousness that he thought he had through mere external obedience to the commands of Scripture. And that his obedience, when he looks at it after his conversion, counted as less than nothing at all. As a matter of fact, he, he uh, assigns it to the dung heap. He says it's awful. Uh, it, it was merely external performance without any faith of any kind whatsoever. And so he considers this external display of righteousness that he once thought was so important uh, 
to be less than nothing, to be worthless after his conversion. Now, as Paul grew in faith in Christ, he saw his own sinfulness more and more, as often Christians do. Now, notice that Paul is not saying as he grew older in Christ, he became more sinful. But rather, as he grew older in Christ, he became aware of just how sinful he truly was in himself. There's an illustration that is given uh, from time to time of someone walking through a train tunnel in the dark, in the middle of the tunnel, and falling down and getting covered in mud. And then standing up in the middle of that darkness and trying to brush the mud off and thinking that you've gotten it all. But as you approach the light at the end of the tunnel, you begin to see more and more mud on you. Now, it's been there all along. You thought you'd taken care of it, but... Now, as the light, uh, as you grow closer to the light, you begin to see more and more just how much mud there is still left on you. That's what's going on with the Apostle Paul. As he grew older in Christ, he is beginning to realize aspects of sin that he had not even realized about himself earlier in his uh, Christian life. And so we discover that the Apostle Paul, at the very beginning of his ministry, says this about himself. He says, I am the least of the apostles. Toward the middle of his ministry, he says, I am the least of all the saints. And now toward the end of his ministry, Paul writes, I am the chief of sinners. Not because he got worse and worse and worse, but because the closer he grew to Christ and the light of Christ, the more he saw in the light of Christ his own sin and his sinfulness. And so he understands by calling himself the chief of sinners that this is exactly what he is like. He sees his sin to a greater degree. Now notice also Paul does not say, I was the chief of sinners, but I am the chief of sinners. And what he's meaning by that is that he continues to need Christ all the time. He continually needs the continual grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ alone for such salvation. And so he rests upon Christ, he trusts in Christ and in Christ alone for that salvation. Paul continues, however, for this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So Paul was chosen by God from before the foundation of the world. He was chosen in Christ to be saved and in Christ to become an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was chosen, Paul says here, to obtain this mercy from God in order to be able to demonstrate to God's elect who would come after him of the long-suffering patience of Almighty God. Now, what he's meaning by all of this is that his salvation is a pattern for ours. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to have a Damascus Road experience as Paul did. What it does mean is that the pattern that God exercises in Paul's life of putting up with Paul in great long suffering while Paul continued to be a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insolent man, giving him opportunity uh, to come to that appointed time for salvation on the Damascus road. That's what he's getting at, as God was long-suffering to him, not destroying him instantly like that because of his sin, but putting up with him to bring him in God's time and in God's way to that point of conversion to Christ. That's the example that is set for us. Uh, so God put up with Paul's blasphemy, God put up with Paul's persecution, God put up with Paul's insolence in order to eventually bring him to that place where he met the risen Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. And what that means is he puts up with our sin without snuffing us out instantly in order to bring us to that time in our lives when we are brought to 
faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. And so the point is simply this. If God could save a man like Paul, He can save anybody. He can save you. He can save me. And so Paul is that example of a terribly wicked man, a man who thought he was doing the right thing but was totally wrong. He brings this person to that point where he confronts him with the risen Savior and grants to Paul grace and mercy and faith and love in Jesus Christ. And Paul becomes a believer and then Paul is commissioned to be an apostle. Paul is so overcome by the mercy and the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ that he breaks out in this praise to God spontaneously. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible. He speaks of God under these marvelous terms. He calls him king. A king was a term that was used in the Old Testament to describe God as the ruler of the heavens and the earth, the ruler of the universe. It's a depiction of God seated upon his throne in heaven, ruling and reigning over all things. He is eternal. Literally, he is the king of the eons. Now, what's an eon, you might ask? Uh, Linsky in his commentary says this, eons are vast eras that are marked by what transpires in them whether they are conceived as belonging to time or to eternity. And so this term eon can refer not only to our present history and our past history and our future history, but it can go all the way back and refer to eternity past and continue in the future and and, uh, refer to eternity future. It's an eon and the things that transpire within it. God is immortal. Meaning, quite simply, God cannot die. Now, Jesus Christ, the God-man, did die once for all upon the cross because He is both man as well as God. But God Himself, God alone, can never die. And finally, Paul describes Him as being invisible, which means He cannot be seen with the naked eye. Uh, He is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, one of the things that talking about God being invisible does here is it helps us understand why God tells us in the Ten Commandments that we are not to make any graven image of Him. All idols are wrong. All depictions of God are wrong because God is invisible. He cannot be pictured in any way. And in that regard, He is distinct from these false gods and these false idols of all of the nations, because they are uh, made by men's hands. They are depictions of the thoughts of men about God. But God is invisible. He cannot be depicted in any way and should not be depicted in any way. Now, depending upon your Bible translation, you may read something a little different at this next section. To God who alone is wise, it says in the New King James. The ESV reads, to God alone, to the only God. And the King James and the New King James speak of God as being the only wise God. Both of these statements are absolutely true and scriptural. We know that God is the only God. Deuteronomy 6, 4 tells us that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. And we know that God is wise because of what Paul says in Romans chapter 16, verse 27. To God alone wise be glory through Christ Jesus forever. Amen. And so God is the only God. We know that this is the case. He alone exists, which means that all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, as Paul says, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, The wisdom of God is all-encompassing. He is all-knowing. What that means is God never has to learn anything. He knows it already exhaustively. We cannot even begin to comprehend what that means. We have to learn from the time that we are born until the time we die. We are growing and we are learning new things. 
God knows everything, and God knows everything about everything, all at the same time without ever having to study or learn it. He just knows it completely. He is all wise. And He is God forever. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen, Paul says. To this one and only true God, Paul offers up this wonderful praise. He desires for God to receive from men and from angels honor and glory. And he desires that this honor and glory be given to God forever and ever, or literally for the eons of the eons, meaning without end of any kind, never endingly. Throughout all eternity, Paul's desire is for God to continually receive honor and praise and glory from men and angels from all of creation without stop, without end, forever. Now, can you echo this prayer of the Apostle Paul? Can you uh, say with Paul that God deserves this honor and this glory forever and ever? You only can if you are a Christian. Now, if you are not a Christian today, I urge you to flee from your sin, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, to put your faith in Him and in Him alone. For as we've said already, there is no other salvation found anywhere in the universe. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. And so if you've never done so before, do so now. Trust in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. And you will find this uh, glory and honor of Christ overwhelming you. And you will desire to praise Him and be able to praise Him, not only in this life, but throughout all eternity. Amen. Let us pray once again. Almighty and gracious God, we thank You so much. We praise You that You indeed alone are worthy of honor and glory not only in time and in history, but throughout all the eons to come, that you are God and there is no other, that you are wise, that you are holy, that you are gracious, that you are merciful, that you are loving, and so many other things that we cannot even begin to imagine. And so, Father, I pray that any listening or watching today who are apart from you might be brought to the foot of the cross today, that they might be brought as Paul was brought on the Damascus Road to realize that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord, that He is King of kings, that He is the Savior of sinners, and that they might receive from the gift of the Holy Spirit faith and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ to trust in Him for salvation. So please grant and move in a powerful way. I ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for being with me this week, and I look forward to bringing the Word of God again next time.